micróbios e o homem. Começa uma revolução na forma de se compreender a doença. Seus efeitos serão universais. Mas neste momento ainda são poucas as sementes plantadas e poucos são aqueles capazes de perceber no que elas poderão se transformar. Bols Plateau, perto de Chartres. Como em muitos outros distritos da França, os campos estão cheios de carneiros mortos. Uma peste mantém os rebanhos longe de campos de boa qualidade. Já então, um destacado cientista, Louis Pasteur, está decidido a fazer alguma coisa em relação do antraz, ou pústula maligna. I don't know what Chamblon is complaining about. All he has to do is feed a few thistles to some sheep. Just so, sir, but it's not so easy. It may not be easy, Mr. Roux, but it is science. O germe do antraz já foi identificado e isolado numa cultura líquida. Mas como os animais contraíam a doença era ainda um mistério. Um dos assistentes de Pasteur, Chamberlain, realiza uma experiência com o objetivo de testar uma teoria de Pasteur, segundo a qual os animais absorvem os esporos dos micróbios através do alimento. Chamberlain está alimentando carneiros com cardos contaminados. Era assim que se faziam experiências. Pasteur tinha as ideias imaginativas e seus dedicados assistentes as colocavam em prática, nem sempre de boa vontade. Come on, come on, eat the damn stuff, can't you? Can't you see the great man's arrived? Splendid news, sir. Another two have just died. Excellent. Have the autopsies been performed? We usually do those in the morning. I should like you to do them straight away, please. Agora, já com quase 56 anos, Pasteur ainda sofria as consequências do derrame de 10 anos atrás. Mas estava prestes a ter início o período mais excitante da sua vida. O objetivo da equipe era determinar exatamente de que maneira, ano após ano, os animais contraíam a doença. Sabiam que estavam envolvidos numa experiência perigosa. O manuseio dos germes do antraz era extremamente perigoso, pois os homens também podiam sucumbir à doença. Rose era o único médico da equipe, sempre muito prático, via com profunda desconfiança as teorias muitas vezes extravagantes de Pasteur. E não gostava de ficar recebendo ordens. De que maneira esses minúsculos germes podiam derrubar rapidamente um animal tão grande, era algo que fascinava Pasteur. De qualquer maneira, ele estava convencido de que o germe do antraz era o único responsável pela morte dos carneiros. A autópsia confirmou sua teoria, agora tudo o que ele precisava fazer era satisfazer os seus céticos oponentes. Until the bacteria or their spores have been completely isolated and freed of every foreign element. Why does the disease happen only in certain areas? Why does it happen only in summer? And finally, how does it manage to lie dormant for such long periods before becoming active again? How can a single organism result in these anomalies? I say there must be some other cause. <laughs> Professor Collar continues to believe in another agent because he wishes it were so. This only proves his obstinate refusal to take into account the real truth contained in the experiments conducted by Herr Koch and others, including myself, in which it was proved conclusively that no other virulent agent exists. Now I remind Monsieur Pasteur that I have made over 500 experiments in anthrax over the past 12 years. Then may I suggest that Monsieur Collin is not as competent with a microscope as you would like to think? Oh, sure. I observe seriously 
I experiment seriously, and I believe I have the right to be taken seriously. Pasteur sabia muito bem que parte das críticas que lhe eram dirigidas eram válidas. Ele não era capaz de dizer com certeza por que a doença se comportava daquela maneira. De explicar, por exemplo, por que a doença só ocorria em certas áreas e por que permanecia adormecida por tanto tempo. Esses micro-organismos, aparentemente simples, ainda tinham muita coisa a ser explicada. Of course. When an animal dies, where does it go? Why back to the earth, where it falls? And then perhaps months later, perhaps years later. The spores from the dead body rise to the surface and reinfect other animals. How? How do the spores rise to the surface? But would they retain their virulence all that time? Why not? We find it difficult enough to get rid of them as it is. Mas por que meio os esporos poderiam retornar à superfície? A solução foi sugerida por uma observação perspicaz e uma intuição inspirada. I think you found it. Earthworms. Well, it's possible, I suppose. Era quase simples demais para ser verdade. Ansioso para confirmar sua teoria, Pasteur via as visitas que seus assistentes costumavam trazer ao laboratório como uma incômoda intrusão. O laboratório era para ele um lugar de concentração, de disciplina. Do we understand each other, gentlemen? Back to your work, please. Back to your work. How are we? What a way to spend one's youth. A disciplina no laboratório podia ser difícil de engolir, mas produziu bons resultados. Were discovered in the earth cylinders which filled their intestinal tube. I would not be surprised if at the moment the academy doubted the veracity of these facts. However, earthworms are the messengers of the germs, and it is they which, from the depth of the burial, bring back to the surface of the soil the terrifying parasite. Excellent. Let them contest that. Herr Koch, will he agree? Why shouldn't he? He hasn't advanced any theory of his own. But how would you have felt if somebody had tried to improve on your work on silkworms? I should have been delighted. <laughs> Science does not belong to any one man. Koch did not invent anthrax. The man's a plagiarist. He not only misinterprets my work, he wants to take all the credit for it as well. <laughs> They say that he's also claiming that the sheep that died of the infected thistles contracted the disease through scratches in their mouths and pharynx. But everybody knows that anthrax is an intestinal disease. He's not unknown, you know. Monsieur Pasteur is a man of note. Don't you think it might be as well to listen to his theories instead of dismissing them out of hand? Gertrude? I am not dismissing them out of hand. All I'm saying is that to listen to him talk, anybody would think it was he, not I, that discovered the cause of anthrax. <laughs> well, there's nothing new in that at all. There's a sort of facile neatness in the idea. For his theory that it's the earthworms that are bringing the spores to the surface, if anything, they would destroy the spores. And has the man never learned of the pathogenic action of worms? Hmm? <laughs> You'd better have your soup. Your evening patients will be here any moment. Alguns anos antes, Koch demonstrara brilhantemente todo o ciclo de vida do Bacillus anthracis. Agora perdi a dianteira para Pasteur. Vivendo ainda no ambiente humilde de um médico do interior da Alemanha, ele não tinha nada além dos seus animais e de sua imaginação criativa para ampliar seus interesses científicos. Aqui Koch iniciava então desconhecida técnica de fotografar micróbios. Coming, papá. Now. 
Seu equipamento ele muitas vezes improvisou. Ou comprou com um modesto salário. Armado com um novo equipamento, ele iniciou a tarefa de identificar, sem deixar margem a dúvidas, bactérias específicas. Mas Koch não dispunha de uma plateia com quem pudesse discutir o seu trabalho e foi obrigado a recorrer a uma abordagem pessoal. Em junho de 1878, o homem mais poderoso da medicina alemã, Rudolf Virchow, arranjou-lhe um emprego em Berlim. As a rule, Herr Professor, it's impossible to measure them at all accurately or hold them still long enough to sketch. <laughs> of course, but I've developed ways of staining them with dyes. I find methylene blue most effective. And then, photographing them. Mm, interesting. I cannot take it seriously. <laughs> I, I, I don't understand, Herr Professor. Well, this business of bacteria floating around in the air is hardly serious medicine. It leaves far too many questions unanswered. Yes, for example, why is it that you and I could be sitting in the same room at the same time, and yet you can track cholera and I don't? Well, it's not a question of them um, settling like a cloud, eh, Professor? When I studied it in Eastern Silesia, there was no doubt in my mind what caused cholera. Poor food. Bad sanitation, inadequate housing, yes, even the lack of education. I too have seen cholera, Herr Professor, in the war with Austria. There was a particularly... The trouble with you strange. people is you take a simplistic view of life. Nothing in science can be caused by only one thing. Imagine a bacillus as a disease. Maybe a hundred causes. Yes, what about environment and tuberculosis? Between heredity and thysis. But these things may be relevant to bacteria. My dear doctor, I was researching embolism and leukemia before you were born. Don't tell me what may or may not be relevant in a diagnosis. O obstinado orgulho profissional, por um lado, e a simples ignorância do outro, estavam nas raízes do sofrimento humano, que tanto Cor quanto Pasteur viam ao seu redor. Pasteur agora frequentava cada vez mais os hospitais. E embora sua abordagem fosse muito diferente da de Koch, os objetivos dos dois homens eram os mesmos. Isolar o micróbio e associá-lo, de forma irrefutável, à doença. These are the instruments we use, monsieur. Forceps, decapitation hooks. You flame them before use? No, sir. But you do nothing else? We wash them thoroughly, sir. In boiling water, of course. No, in warm water, but we use plenty of soap. And the dressings? This is the kind of stuff, sir. Best calico, very absorbent. You sterilize it before using it? No, sir, we use it just as it is, but you can see that it is clean. We do what we can, sir. Yes, all right, sir. Uh, you have some patients for us to see? Yes, if you would, over here. Fifteen years after Lister, and they still won't listen. No steam treatment, no flaming, no antiseptics. These women are dying of purple and fever. And every one of them could be saved. Today, we have been hearing a great deal about diseases which are caused by organisms floating in the air. This is dangerous nonsense. But fortunately, the great art of medicine has always survived its opponents. As for disease, did not our great master Hippocrates himself tell us it is caused by bad odors drawn down into the body and then expelled to infect others? These miasmas are well known. <coughs> Purple fever is a good example. It is certainly not caused by one of these microorganisms, which are so widely distributed in nature and in the midst of whom we live without being troubled by them. A ignorância e a rejeição de novas ideias existiam em todos os níveis. 
Mas até que as pesquisas sobre o papel dos micróbios trouxessem resultados práticos, os experimentadores, como eram chamados, não podiam esperar outra coisa. Seek the microbe, Ru. There's always the microbe. There's nothing being done. Nothing! It's happened. We're going to Berlin. They've confirmed my appointment. I can't, I can't believe it. They, they're offering me a laboratory and two assistants. You mean we're leaving here? Well, of course. It's a wonderful opportunity to work with the right equipment. And, and in Berlin, we'll be right at the center of things. Never. What do you, what, what do you mean? I've no wish to leave Wolfstein. It suits me here. Well, what about my work? Your work? <laughs> you call it work? These animals, the stink of the place, and now you want to start all over again in Berlin? Here we have friends. Here we have a position. What can Berlin offer against that? I take up my appointment in five days. We leave immediately. Em julho de 1880, Koch tomou posse cheio de orgulho do seu novo cargo na melhor escola de ciência médica da Europa. Foi uma oportunidade de se unir à principal corrente de pesquisa microbiológica, o que ele precisava desesperadamente. Eu sou o Dr. Lerner. Ah, bem-vindo a Berlim. Obrigado. O acaso, disse uma vez Pasteur, só favorece a mente que está preparada. E a pura sorte se revelaria sua benfeitora. Pasteur e seu sobrinho, o recém-recrutado Adrian Loire, começaram a estudar um germe que atacava as galinhas, matando 90 de cada 100 aves numa área infectada. Em qualquer operação que envolvesse o preparado de culturas puras do micróbio, Pasteur insistia sempre no silêncio absoluto. Ele acreditava que um distúrbio do ar pudesse agitar a poeira e contaminar suas culturas. Passavam gotas do líquido infectado de um frasco para o outro. Cada frasco continha um nutriente no qual só o micróbio se desenvolvia. Em seguida, depois que todas as outras impurezas tivessem sido eliminadas e só então, as aves vivas eram inoculadas. E o resultado era inevitável. Going already, Mr. Chamblon? We did say we might leave early, as we all start our holidays tomorrow. Ah, yes. Well... Would you kindly inoculate the hens with this culture before you leave? Yes, sir. feito centenas de inoculações em galinhas vivas, Chamberlain não viu muito problema nessa única omissão.
De volta das férias, Chamberlain encontrou a cultura que Pasteur lhe entregara duas semanas antes. Chamberlain inoculou as galinhas. E contrariando todas as expectativas, elas não morreram. Are you sure that you use the culture that I gave you? Yes, monsieur. When did you inject? Well, I have to admit, three days ago on my return. Mm. Well, perhaps it was a bad batch. Let's start again. More chickens? Yes. And, but re-inject these chickens as well. And this time, Mr. Chamblon, Make sure the culture is fresh. E assim foi feita a inoculação com a cultura fresca. As galinhas inoculadas agora morreram. Mas aquelas que haviam sobrevivido à primeira injeção sobreviveram também à segunda. Deliberately, every stage of what you did by accident. Now, you're quite sure that nothing has happened to that culture that you haven't told me about? Quite sure. Right. And starting from the very beginning, we'll inject again. Right. The culture that you, Mr. Chambron, left lying about and exposed to the air has somehow become weakened. I've given them the disease in a benign form. Yes, but still strong enough to stimulate their defenses against the later injections of the virulent microbe. You mean they've been given a, a sort of immunity against further attacks? Exactly. Thanks to Monsieur Chambelon's negligence, gentlemen, I think we may have a vaccine. Esta foi a primeira vez em que se produziu uma vacina do próprio micróbio que transmitia a doença. Pasteur estava agora decidido a aplicar o mesmo princípio ao bacilo do antrás. Imediatamente ocorreram problemas. Em vez de enfraquecer os bacilos do antrás, a exposição simplesmente permitia que os esporos continuassem crescendo. E eram os esporos os responsáveis pelo caráter pernicioso da doença. Era preciso encontrar uma maneira de matar os esporos e enfraquecer os bacilos. We know that the spores are heat sensitive. At above 42 degrees, they no longer fall. Cock showed us that. Now, how does that help us? Very little. Because heat also kills the bacilli, making them useless as a vaccine. But are we absolutely sure that the bacilli are killed at 42 degrees, or even 43, or 44? Oh, what difference does that mean? Well, it could mean that there is perhaps a range of several degrees above 42 at which the bacilli survive enough to produce a vaccine. Esta foi uma observação inspirada e que seria confirmada pela experiência. 18 de fevereiro de 1881, a Academia de Ciências. A virulência do antrax microbe é perdida depois de heating por 8 dias a uma temperatura de 42 a 43 graus. Os experimentos de campo mostraram que os pigs, rabbits e os sheep ganham uma imunidade para a disease when inoculated with a vaccine which has been successfully weakened by the method I have described. Perhaps Monsieur Pasteur would explain to us the process of attenuation. I have done so. The microbe is affected by exposure to the air. But surely Monsieur Pasteur has already told us that the spores of the anthrax bacillus are resistant to the atmosphere for an indefinite period. As witness his theory of infected soil. The secret 
lies in the temperature. No admittance? Yes, but he'll want to see this. Not until this evening. But this concerns us all. Rossignol has issued a challenge. A challenge? It's true. Listen to this. Microbes are in fashion. Pasteur the pontiff has claimed that the microbe alone is responsible for anthrax. These are sacramental words I have spoken. So he challenges him to a public demonstration of the anthrax vaccine in the districts of Mellon, Fontainebleau and Provins. Do you think he'll accept? Of course he will accept. Have you ever known the master turn down a challenge? Never. That's half the trouble. Ah. Uh, you have agreed that the demonstration should take place at the farm of Fuila Four near Mellon in May. That is correct for which the Mela Agricultural Society have placed 60 sheep at your disposal. Uh, 25 of these sheep will be inoculated with your anti-anthrax vaccine at 12 or 15 days interval. Some days later, these 25, together with our 25 untreated sheep, will be inoculated with virulent anthrax culture. Is that correct? The 25 unvaccinated sheep will all perish. Afterwards, the survivors, if any, will be compared with ten sheep who have had no treatment whatsoever. The twenty-five vaccinated sheep will all live. Excellent. And now, gentlemen, if you'll excuse me. And why didn't you consult us? Well, I saw no reason to. But you've left yourself no room for a treat. I wasn't aware that I needed any. The vaccine, monsieur, the vaccine is still unreliable. Unless it's kept at the exact temperature, it doesn't work. Do you know how difficult that is in laboratory conditions? How could you agree to use it under these circumstances? The vaccine will be just as good on 50 sheep at Pui as it was on 14 in the laboratory. No! Forgive me, Dr. Rue, but, uh, well, is there any alternative? Yes. Chamblon and I have been working on another vaccine. Another vaccine? Well, we should have told you, I suppose. I dare say we'd have got right to it in the end. Hmm. It's true. We would have told you. It's outrageous. What I've published to the world that my vaccine is infallible. My own assistance. It's the oxidation that's the trouble, monsieur. The trouble? It's the whole basis of the attenuation. How can you question it? It doesn't always work. And as for the matter of temperature, we'll never keep it up. Half a degree out and one single spore could make it ineffective. You know that. You know how difficult it is to do here and you expect us to guarantee in a farmyard that every single one of those injections will be free of spores? I say it will work. No. You can't be sure. One mistake, just one mistake. And those sheep will die. Now, our method is to treat the bacteria with bichromate of potassium. Yes, and it does work. Always, each time. You can't take the risk of using anything else. You must forget oxidation by exposure. Never. Oxidation is my text. I can't run the risk of using a vaccine that I know nothing about. Then you'll fail. And this challenge will destroy you. Fui le fort perto de Melon, 5 de maio de 1882. Os primeiros animais a serem inoculados são aqueles protegidos contra o antrás. Numa época em que demonstrações científicas constituíam uma grande novidade, essa experiência pública tornou-se um acontecimento nacional. A maioria apostava no fracasso da experiência. A comunidade médica e veterinária se mostrava, em sua grande maioria, cética. A maioria das pessoas se reunira para assistir o sacrifício de 50 animais. 
Pasteur decidiu usar a vacina química de Ruth, mas extremamente cioso de sua reputação, determinara que o mundo não deveria ser informado sobre esse detalhe. Estava em jogo mais do que a simples reputação pessoal de Pasteur. O fracasso de uma experiência tão divulgada quanto esta poderia ser desastroso para o próprio conceito de vacina nos anos seguintes. A doença seria produzida por duas inoculações dos bacilos enfraquecidos. A segunda, mais forte que a primeira, seria feita após o um intervalo de duas semanas. Cada uma delas induziria um ataque brando da doença. Marie escreveu ao primo. 17. The 25 sheep have survived their first inoculations. Today a second inoculation will be made with a stronger culture. Roux and Chambeland are in constant attendance on the sheep. So far they have found nothing abnormal. Louis no longer feels such great confidence about the outcome and is becoming increasingly anxious. I always was impatient. Sometimes I think I'm totally unfitted by nature for my profession. Nothing can be hurried. You know that better than me. Trinta e um de maio. Hoje todos os animais deverão ser inoculados com o bacilo do antraz. Da multidão fazem parte, como sempre, os céticos. E também Monsieur Colin, ainda aborrecido com os confrontos regulares com Pasteur. Sempre desconfiado do trabalho dos outros, Colin achava que a experiência era uma fraude. The weight of the bacteria having caused them to sink. Now, I believe that Pasteur will attempt to inoculate his own animals from the upper part to improve his chances of success. The moment has come. Monsieur Pasteur, here is the anthrax bacillus to be injected into all the sheep. Mr. what are you doing? Making sure that each of the animals receives an equal portion of the virulence, Monsieur Pasteur. To satisfy you, Monsieur, we will inject a triple dose into each sheep. And you'll inoculate the vaccinated and unvaccinated alternately, Monsieur Pasteur? It shall be done exactly as you wish, sir. Injeções do bacilo do antraz virulento não havia retorno. Quatro dias deveriam se passar até que os bacilos se tornassem ativos. Na quarta noite, Rose e Chamberlain fizeram um último exame nos carneiros para detectar qualquer indício de infecção. Deveriam informar o resultado a Pasteur em Paris. Ah. I expected you sooner. Well? 
Well, there's no doubt the unvaccinated sheep is coming. The, the breathlessness is at a maximum. They can barely walk. Three of them are dead already. Yes, yes, but what of the vaccinated ones? They also are sickening. What? It's true. Several have developed a temperature, one of over 40 degrees. Another has presented an edema at the point of inoculation. Are you sure? This has never happened before. There's no doubt. Oh, what could have gone wrong? The vaccine has never failed. Well, what did Monsieur Rossignol say? He believes that um, all of them will die during the night. I should never have listened to you. What do I know of your vaccine? This would never have happened with mine. To be destroyed now, with success in our grasp, and the whole world watching. That's too much. The cruelest thing about this is that if it fails, the world will never again believe my theory. There's only one thing for it. You must return to the farm alone. I won't face the ridicule and sarcasm of those people. It was your arrogance that brought it about, and you must suffer the humiliation. And now please leave me. My vaccine have failed. It's too soon to talk of failure. Have faith in rule. Like the old days. We worked all night, hardly slept. Oh, I need your strength. You have enough of your own. When you arrive this afternoon, all the non-vaccinated sheep will be dead. Eighteen have already died, and the others are dying. As to the vaccinated ones, they are all well. He ends, it's a stunning success. Pasteur triunfara, com a ajuda da vacina quimicamente preparada de Ru. Mas o mundo ainda não podia saber disso. Cor, no entanto, não parecia muito certo e reagiu em termos dúbios. It is tempting to believe in the possibility of a vaccine for anthrax. But I don't accept what Pasteur claims. Something more than oxidation must have been involved. Some chemical, perhaps. Após a descoberta de Pasteur, o trabalho no laboratório de Koch em Berlim assumiu uma nova importância. 
Todos os esforços eram dedicados ao estudo de uma doença humana específica, uma doença que matava uma em cada sete pessoas na Europa, a tuberculose assassina. Em praticamente toda a casa havia pelo menos um membro da família que sofria, estava morrendo ou tinha morrido vítima da tuberculose. Se pelo menos se pudesse produzir uma vacina. Assim como Pasteur, Koch era um ardente nacionalista. A glória do seu país o impulsionava. Os bacilos da tuberculose eram extremamente pequenos, talvez um décimo do tamanho dos micróbios do antrás. A sua busca fora difícil, mas agora pelo menos os bacilos haviam sido identificados. We should have seen something by now. Well, we must start again. Sempre meticuloso, Cork deu uma última espiada antes de jogar fora as culturas. Dr. Leffler. Agora que era capaz de cultivar o bacilo, Cork estava a caminho de produzir uma vacina. Eu ia tirar eles fora. A enfermaria de tuberculose de um hospital em Berlim. Nos últimos 30 anos ocorreu uma revolução no conhecimento da doença. Mas em enfermarias como esta, tal conhecimento não causou grandes efeitos. Doenças infecciosas como a tuberculose ainda não tinham sido controladas. Os pacientes recebiam um lambedor para a tosse, uma escarradeira e o melhor atendimento possível. Naquela época morriam mais pessoas vítimas da tuberculose do que qualquer outra causa isolada. Acontecia mais ou menos o mesmo com a difteria, uma doença infantil muitas vezes fatal. Mais uma vez o mecanismo da doença já era conhecido, mas o tratamento dessas crianças era ainda muito precário, até mesmo perigoso. Mas o sucesso dos franceses no tratamento da raiva havia feito aumentar a expectativa popular. Aqui em Berlim, Robert Koch sentia que esperavam dele uma conquista de magnitude semelhante. Sentindo essa pressão, ele começou a trabalhar em segredo. Ele era agora diretor do Instituto de Higiene, onde conseguira reunir ao seu redor alguns homens notáveis. Um deles era Paul Herrer, 35 anos, judeu e excêntrico. Ainda estudante de medicina, estivera em Breslan quando Koch, então um simples médico do interior, causara a sensação com seu trabalho sobre o antraz. Koch reconhecera a extraordinária habilidade de Erler, mas por falta de dinheiro, a única coisa que pudera lhe oferecer fora um espaço no seu laboratório. Erler trabalhava aqui de graça, um grande teórico. Erler provavelmente sabia mais do que qualquer outra pessoa sobre a natureza da doença. Ou tanto quanto Emil Bering, um médico que trabalhava para o exército para aumentar os seus rendimentos. O filho ambicioso de uma família pobre. Temperamental, arrogante, ele jamais se dera bem com Cor. Mas suas pesquisas eram promissoras. Ele retomara, juntamente com o japonês Kitasato, o trabalho iniciado pelos franceses sobre a difteria. Buscavam substâncias capazes de neutralizar os venenos encontrados por Emil Rowe no germe da difteria. Beren havia experimentado o tricloreto de iodo, com o qual esperava neutralizar o veneno bacteriano, ou toxina, como era chamado. If you would please to look, Dr. Baring, we have two survivors. They're alive. 
two survivors among such heap of corpses. Progress we make. Até agora, após centenas de tentativas, o tricloreto de iodo tinha revelado pouca eficiência na neutralização da toxina. Mas este sucesso mostrava o caminho para uma nova experiência. Alguns dias mais tarde, o animal estava mais saudável do que nunca. Bering acreditava que essa experiência havia demonstrado que uma substância química produzida naturalmente no sangue havia neutralizado a toxina. Para provar o que dizia, retirou uma gota do soro sanguíneo, desprovido de qualquer outra matéria, de uma cobaia imunizada, misturando-a com germes vivos da difteria. Caso essas bactérias não fossem afetadas, isto significava que devia haver no sangue uma substância química que agia não sobre a bactéria, mas sim sobre as toxinas. Seria, portanto, uma antitoxina. Inject that into an ordinary guinea pig, and if it lives, you would have proved that diphtheria toxin can be neutralized by the serum from immunized animals. To make the French sit up. Monsieur Roux wondered if such a thing were possible to acclimatize an animal to diphtheria toxin and then make it immune. It confers my own work in this field. I must publish. In time, of course, certainly, certainly. Soon. I do not advise it. Your reasons. Well, in the first place, you don't know what this antitoxin is. You yourself refer to it as a mystery. The chemistry is for others to work out. What matters is that from two bedraggled little guinea pigs, which I made immune from diphtheria poison, I have now obtained enough serum to inoculate others by taking it also from animals which are naturally immune. I yes, 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 I have read your report. I'm now obtaining it from rabbits. I shall soon be getting it from sheep. The Institute is becoming a veritable farmyard. By turning the bodies of animals into factories for producing immunized serum, I am aware of your failures, to... Dr. Bering, as I am also aware of your failures. And Dr. Kitisato tells me that some of your animals only remain immune for a week or two. Well, if children have to be inoculated against diphtheria every week, your serum is hardly practicable, no matter how much of it you could produce. There is a lot of work to do, yeah? That is precisely my point. This paper of mine makes no claim beyond the discovery of a diphtheria antitoxin in the blood. Now, if we don't publish that soon, the French will. Roux and Yesan are working in the same field. We have a new Kaiser now. He is proud that we lead the world in medical science. The next International Congress of Medicine takes place here in Berlin in August. If we could herald that occasion I'm well with the publication... Of what the Kaiser expects of us, Bering. But I'm surprised that you should think that patriotism should override our integrity as scientists. Good morning. Oh, In the laboratory. Misses you, Mama, more than you know. He stays up later and later. It's not always work, I know that. You meant a lot to him, Gertrude. And you? You kept him young. He thinks I make him old. That's stupid. He's no one here to talk to now but me. And I never was one he could converse with. Not about his work. You gave him his first microscope. That was a long time ago. Don't make such a martyr of yourself, Mama. He talks of travelling again. That's always a bad sign. No, very well he can't. With all his work at the Institute... Work that gets him nowhere. Nonsense. He's on the point of finding a cure for tuberculosis. 
And when that happens... Your father's not achieved anything for six years now. That worries you? It worries him. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Excellent. The decorations of the great auditorium seem to be coming along splendidly. I'm sure our delegates will be most impressed. Well, then. Just the flowers in here. I think we don't want to detract from the splendors of the main hall, do we? Ah, oh, Dr. Koch, I'll be with you in a moment. And perhaps uh, another like this of the Kaiser on the staircase leading to the royal box. Naquele verão de 1890, a Alemanha receberia 7 mil médicos para o décimo Congresso Internacional de Medicina. Os alemães, conscientes do seu prestígio, preparavam o Congresso com muita seriedade. Nos preparativos estava o ministro da Cultura, Gustav von Kostler. All the same, I feel sure he'd be glad that I don't wish to complete the arrangements for the Congress without first obtaining your approval. Now then, what do you think of that? Yes. Um, what, what is that on the pedestal? A statue of Aesculapius. An appropriate touch, don't you think? And uh, through the archway there, we shall have a representation of the Roman Temple of Minerva. Uh, it is the Kaiser's wish that no expense be spared to indicate the value we place on scientific thought. Well, I only hope the speeches do justice to the splendor of the setting. The Kaiser has every hope that yours will at least her, Professor. As the delegates come up the steps, they'll be greeted by a Latin inscription in gold lettering, welcoming them to the Congress. I understand you're very close to achieving something significant in your work on uh, tuberculosis. Oh, I uh, doubt if my researches will be complete by the time the Congress opens. Oh, the Kaiser will be disappointed to hear that. Well, scientific research can't be hurried, even for the Kaiser. Yes, and of course your work at the Hygiene Institute makes demands on your time unworthy of a man of your great talent. Yes, and that's precisely why it's imperative I be given an institute exclusively for the study of infectious disease. Quite so. Let us hope you may get it. Do you think uh, Dr. Baring could be persuaded to speak at the Congress? Dr. Baring? I'm told he's made some great steps in relation to the uh, cure for diphtheria. But his researches are not yet complete either. Hmm. Well, thank you for your approval of our arrangements, Dr. Koch. And should you find that your work on tuberculosis comes to a satisfactory conclusion... I will, of course, announce it. ...at the Congress. It would be the added Philip needed to persuade Parliament to authorize expenditure for the new institute. And what a triumph for our country. It is, after all, um, eight years, I think, since you discovered the cause of the disease. They'd make you a baron. Von... And that would please you. It might even justify my being in love with you. Oh, you need justification. To love a man as old as you? Certainly I do. So, if I were to retire into obscurity, as I think my wife would like me to... Oh, I could never love a man whose only achievements were behind him. Há mais de dois anos, Koch mantinha um romance secreto com uma jovem chamada Hedwig Freiburg. Ele tinha 47 anos, ela 20. Encontravam-se no estúdio de um artista onde Hedwig trabalhava e onde Koch estivera para posar para um retrato. O processo teve início no dia 4 de agosto de 1890. A decoração de von Gossler para o gigantesco Circus Renzi era no mínimo extravagante. Circulavam rumores de que Koch faria um anúncio importante. Koch deveria ser o segundo orador da manhã. Mas até a última hora os seus próprios colegas não tinham ideia do que ele iria dizer.
Ele poderia tanto anunciar a cura da tuberculose como podia não dizer absolutamente nada. O congresso foi aberto por um dos mais severos críticos de Koch, a iminência parda da medicina alemã, Rudolf Virchow. Por essa razão, eu vou mais uma vez heartily welcome you to our city. May each day contribute more and more to promote mutual understanding and friendship among all of us. Quando Koch se preparou para falar, eram grandes as esperanças de que uma cura para a doença que mais afligia o homem fosse anunciada pelo cientista mais celebrado da época. Surpreendentemente, o discurso de Koch começou com um longo apanhado dos últimos progressos da bacteriologia, um assunto com o qual a maior parte do auditório estava bastante familiarizada. Não era de surpreender que depois de meia hora de discurso, a impaciência acabasse se transformando em desapontamento. Koch decepcionara todo mundo. I have set about seeking for substances that could be used therapeutically against tuberculosis. Now we reach it. Do you hear? Do you hear? And I have pursued this search perseveringly up to the present. I have tested a large number of substances to see what influence they would exert on the tubercle bacilli cultivated in pure cultures. With the result that not a few substances have the power to hinder growth of the tubercle bacilli. But however effective on pure cultures, none reacted effectively upon animals suffering from tuberculosis. However, in spite of many failures, I have at last hit upon a substance that has the power of preventing the growth of tubercle bacilli. Not, a, not only in the test tube, but in the body of an animal. are not yet completed and I can only say this about them. Guinea pigs, if exposed to this substance, cease to react to the inoculation of the tuberculosis virus and in those suffering from the disease, to a high degree the morbid process can be brought completely to a standstill. However, speaker was Professor Koch on bacteriological research. His report concerned a remedy for consumption discovered by the speaker, which he did not, however, name. And that is all, my friend. What the care am I? The Zeitung last night didn't mention him at all, but he gave a vivid description of what the Duke and Duchess of Bavaria were wearing in the royal box. It's typical, typical. Please to hope they're not showing more prudence than we are. So, this is it, the magic lymph. Am I the first to see it? Apart from my assistant, Dr. Livitz. So the great killer is to be felled at last. 
It's a little early to say that, Minister. The Kaiser has asked me to convey to you personally his congratulations on your achievement. But there is no achievement yet, Minister. Anyone who listened carefully to what I said yes, Asian, which will be recorded in the annals of our country as one of the great milestones of medical history. Only if tuberculin works. There is a doubt. It's only been tried on guinea pigs. One rather gathered. I said, very plainly, that my researches are not yet completed. I don't recall. There was too much emotional fuss going on, perhaps. Read my paper yourself. And show it to the Emperor if you wish. He will see that the hysterical reception I was given yesterday owed more to your flags and flowers and Grecian urns than it did to my researches. You're not telling me now that you've not found a cure. The Kaiser wants to know when the first patients are to be treated. It's not even been tested on a human being yet. But that surely is important. Yes, yes, Minister, that is important. Then when will trials begin? As soon as I am ready. One of my aides has a brother in the Charité with tuberculosis. He went to see him this morning with news of your discovery. I hope they won't have to wait too long, Carl. May I at least inform His Imperial Highness that hospital tests will begin within one month? Within three months. I hope we are not, after all, disappointed. That would be unthinkable. You will not be disappointed. I think you ought to know, sir, we've had a request from the Moabit Hospital this morning. Also from general practitioners. Requests? Requests for what? For tuberculin, sir. Prepare a dose with it. 0.25. You sure this is wise, sir? I mean, what if something should go wrong? It doesn't have to be tested on you, sir. Who else? Três a quatro dias depois da injeção, Cor ficou muito doente. Mesmo assim, durante o período, registrou detalhadamente todos os sintomas. A princípio, as anotações descreviam suas dificuldades respiratórias, as dores nos membros. No quinto dia, ele registrou um ataque de tremores violentos que durou uma hora. Vômitos e febre de quase 40 graus.
Passaram-se vários dias até que os efeitos da inoculação de Cor finalmente desaparecessem. As pressões eram tão grandes que, com base na sua própria experiência, Cor permitiu que tivessem início experiências em larga escala no Hospital Charrot. Seu genro, Dr. Edward Poe, limitou inicialmente as injeções aos casos mais brandos. Doctor, excuse me, sir. You passed me. Oh, we are merely conducting tests, sir. But you can't leave me out. I need it more than anyone. Yes, but it is not yet authorized for general practice. Do I mind that? What have I got to lose that I'll not lose anyway without it? You can't leave some of us out, sir. He's like a medieval mountebank. Dr. Cox, magic elixir. Secrets known only to him. Look at these blood clots after 30 seconds. I now know how much, how much ricin is needed to clot the blood of a mouse weighing 10 grams and kill it in 48 hours. Yes, 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 yes. Forgive me for intruding. It's probably some Pasteur type attenuated vaccine. Why won't he say? He should reveal his research work. Yes, sir, I must get back to mine. If the doses are built up gradually, the mouse develops immunity long before the fatal dose is reached. Wasserman and I want to carry this work into your field, Emil, working out precisely how diphtheria antitoxin is built up. If you ask me, it's an antitoxin Koch is working on. How so? He's familiar enough with my work on diphtheria and tetanus. Robert Koch stands in no need of other people's ideas, Dr. Bering. He's produced nothing original for six years. Picks my brains on antitoxins, tells me not to publish. And a few months later comes out with something that sounds remarkably similar and refuses even to reveal how he arrived at it. Goodman is going to try it out at the Moabit Hospital. I said I'd help him. You? I am a qualified doctor of medicine. But you don't know what tuberculin is. Dr. Cock does. That's enough for most of us. Dentro de poucas semanas, o anúncio de Koch de que os testes deveriam ser iniciados em breve causaram uma reação que ultrapassou seus piores temores. Dezenas e milhares de tuberculosos de todo o mundo começaram a chegar a Berlim. O frio era intenso. Apenas uns poucos eram tratados no Charity. Os outros eram abrigados em clínicas improvisadas nos principais hotéis. I can give no more injections tonight. My supplies are limited. I'll be back again at six tomorrow evening. But my son is dying. Then I doubt if Dr. Cox Slim would save him anywhere. It is not recommended for advanced cases. It's our only hope. We have come all the way from Montreal. Everyone has come a long way, madame. Some of the patients in the lounge have come from America. But what do we do? There are no more admissions to the hospitals. We don't even have anywhere to stay. I could probably arrange that I'm admitted to a private clinic. Well, when? The fee is 1,000 marks a week, with a further 300 marks for the treatment. I couldn't afford that. No one could. Enough can. Otherwise, that would not be the price. <coughs> Try the Germania. Dr. Levy is giving injections there at 6.30. The Germania? Where's that? Turn to the right out of the hotel and keep going. It's on the Alexanderplatz. O escritor Conan Doyle, que passou esse inverno em Berlim, afirmou que o número dos que morriam em virtude das terríveis condições era maior do que o número daqueles que poderiam ser curados pela linfa de Koch. Tell the world you have a cure for consumption and then be surprised when the world beats a path to your door. You should have let well alone. You only did it out of vanity. Trying to show them you were still Robert Koch. I'm only 47, Emmy. I have years ahead of me yet. Years and years of original work. You've done more than most. Great achievements. Anthrax, cholera, the TB microbe. 
Cerca de dois mil médicos também chegaram a Berlim. Queriam ser um dos vinte que acompanhavam o professor Bergman em sua visita diária aos pacientes. High fever. Almost 40 degrees. Observe the effect of the injection in the tubercular swelling of his cheeks, nose, neck, even arms. Also, the lymphatic glands are swollen. And most of his joints. But when he recovers from this attack brought on by the tuberculin, He will be able to move his arms much more easily, and we hope we well on the way to full recovery. Ah, now. This patient received his injection a week ago, and as you see, he's growing stronger. Well done. There's no point administering the lymph to really advanced cases where the tuberculosis is too ingrained to be cured, or where processes apart from tubercular ones, such as changes in the pulmonary tissue, are at work. Though too early to say uh, what the lasting effect will be, there's no doubt that in the short term at least, Dr. Cox's treatment is proving effective. The hour belongs to the admirable triumph of the human mind. The epoch-making discovery of Professor Koch. Read it for yourself, my dear fellow. The president of Switzerland, no less, addressing their parliament. What a splendid hour this is for Germany. No wonder the Kaiser means to honor you in person. The Grand Cross of the Order of the Red Eagle. You will note that this patient is now free from fever. Her coughing has stopped completely. She no longer has flushes in the night. And she's put on some weight. Another important fact is that auscultation and percussion suggest a change in parts of the lungs that used to be affected. However, she should not be considered to be completely cured yet. In some cases, the bacilli disappear, producing the physical manifestations you just observed, only to be produced anew in the phlegm. But doubtless, such cases will prove to be exceptions. In recent years, only Bismarck and von Malka have been given the freedom of Berlin. My heartiest congratulations. Have you stopped the profiteering on tuberculin yet? We are going to fix the price at 25 marks for the five gram bottle. 500 doses, that's five pennies each. That's cheap enough. With regard to the rationing of supplies, the priorities first come the university and general hospitals of Berlin, then similar hospitals in the rest of the country, then clinics in Vienna, Paris, London. This patient is now free of fever. Indeed, appears to be free of the disease. It's too early to say that he's cured yet. Relapses are occurring with unexpected suddenness. They think we have a factory producing the lymph. Can't supply any of them. Warmest congratulations to Dr. Koch for his great discovery. Louis Pasteur and staff. No dia 11 de dezembro, Beren leu o seu trabalho sobre as antitoxinas da difteria e causou uma profunda impressão. Possibly the dosage was increased too rapidly. The reactions to the lymph are so varied that all patients must be examined very closely during treatment. If the bacilli get a chance to renew themselves, they act it seems with increased virulence. Em janeiro, um tremendo golpe. Os cadáveres de 21 pacientes que haviam morrido no Charity após o tratamento com a linfa foram dissecados pelo patologista Virchow. Virchow desfrutava de um enorme prestígio e suas conclusões eram indiscutíveis, fossem elas motivadas ou não por sua animosidade em relação a Koch. 
Yes, sir. Completely fresh ones. These swellings can hardly be temporary, as Dr. Cock maintained. Active growth in all internal organs. A cavern in the lung here, sir. tuberculosis I have found in all these cases is worse than anything I have seen in a lifetime as a pathologist. Yes. Well, most embarrassing. Professor Fierkoff is entitled to his opinion. Yes, indeed, an opinion. Unfortunately, it's an opinion which carries a great deal of weight. I constantly stress the need for minimal doses. But some of these doctors in their haste, their ignorance... Yes, yes, yes. Well, fortunately, the government approved the new institute before this all came out. Let's not get disheartened. It's early days yet. Oh, yes. I mean, there have been many cures. I mean, the, the reports from Hanover are excellent. Exactly. A setback, no more. And when the new Institute for Infectious Diseases opens, a chance to bring together all the finest medical minds of our country, this Dr. Baring, for example, the publication he recently made on diphtheria has caused a great stir. We must look to the future. Yes, sir. Meanwhile, there does seem to be a certain amount of feeling in medical circles, reflected indeed in the national press, that perhaps it is time for you to let us know what your lymph really is. Do you not agree? Quando Cor publicou seus resultados, ficou-se sabendo que no início ele estudara a tuberculose da pele em cobaias. Ele observara que quando uma cobaia já injetada recebia uma segunda dose da cultura de tuberculose, acontecia algo surpreendente. Em vez de piorar, a pele ficava muito inflamada, a ferida original desaparecia e o animal se recuperava. Cor matou então a cultura. Uma vez que a cultura viva era obviamente perigosa e fez um extrato desses bacilos mortos. Mais uma vez os ferimentos sararam. Este era o segredo. A tuberculina era um extrato de germes de tuberculose mortos misturados a um caldo de vitela. But surely it was only an allergic reaction you noticed. Of some interest to immunology, I admit. Certainly, certainly. We'll learn a lot about immunity from this and to help diagnose the disease too, but to cure from a filtered drop. It speeds up the healing of lesions. That at least has been demonstrated. But your basis for this, uh, the principles you worked on and the experiments you used to support them. Yes, if we were based on the principles of attenuation, as Pasteur has defined for us already. But you know, I've always thought some kind of attenuated strain. I had principles in my diphtheria research and a whole set of experiments to support them. And you told me not to publish, sir. And yet you claim a cure for consumption on the basis of a few local reactions in one or two animals. A few? Body temperature, absence of bacilli and excreta, no sign of swollen glands. There was evidence enough. Well, what did you find internally? The public hadn't gone quite mad when the lymph was first You did produced. dissect the animals after you... If doctors had any you... idea about the sizes of dosage... Did you dissect? Did some of the overdoses prescribed were frightening. I mean, no wonder people died. How could I be expected to keep control of what was happening with thousands of hysterical people pouring into Berlin every day? Did Berlin. you dissect? This has taken years of my life! I did not intend to place it precipitately in the hands of fools. I have the right to conduct experiments on my own. I have the right! Robert Koch. And because he is Robert Koch, no one dares to question him. Egypt? Yes. Do you want to come uh, a holiday? Why? Oh, 
Professor Fierkoff is protesting at the haste in setting up the new institute. And luckily, the government understand that a project of this nature must not be imperiled by recent setbacks in one particular field. But I think it will be less embarrassing for all concerned if I were out of the country while the details were settled. Alexandria, I thought. Were you still such a hero? No, Robert, I'm staying here. Assim, Cor foi sozinho para o Egito, deixando para trás a controvérsia sobre a tuberculina. De lá, escreveu para Hathwick. You have been my only consolation in this time of turmoil. As long as you love me, the trials of fate cannot beat me down. Dearest Hedwig, do not abandon me, for your love is my comfort and the star to which I fix my gaze. Ao chegar o outono de 1891, o prometido Instituto de Doenças Infecciosas estava pronto. Da equipe criada por Cor, após seu retorno de Alexandria, faziam parte Paul Erler, Kita Sato e Emily Beren. Seu trabalho sobre antitoxinas o tornara internacionalmente famoso. Sua égolatria aumentara em idênticas proporções. To raise hopes prematurely before you're as certain as you possibly can be is, in my opinion, bordering on the criminal. Please come with me. Nevertheless, Dr. Baring, if you should want to test it on the patient, I myself would have no objection if you did so at once. It would prove nothing. The mortality rate from diphtheria is so variable that if 80% of your patients were cured by the serum, then people would argue that they would have survived anyway. The child behind that screen who won't survive, not even long enough to enjoy a Christmas tree. If there's any chance at all that your serum might work, come and see her. Paralysis yet, but it will come. The progress of the disease appears quite unalterable. An artificial windpipe in the throat may allow her to breathe, but it doesn't halt the disease. Your serum might. You have nothing to lose. The old family house is up for sale in Claustor. Remember it? Of course. I didn't live far from it myself, did I? I might buy it back again. We're leaving Berlin? No. But it would be convenient to have somewhere near Strasbourg, where Trudy is. And since you liked Klaustor, I thought you might be happier there than in Berlin. Leaving you here, with Hedwig Freiburg. Na véspera do Natal de 1891, a antitoxina da difteria foi usada pela primeira vez. tend to make a speech, uh, but on this, our first New Year's Eve together, I would like to um, 
wish you all success in your various endeavors in the coming year. <clears throat> and to propose a toast. Uh, to the Institute. To the Institute. charity. Our serum cures. Cures? What? Who? The diphtheria case I inoculated on Christmas Eve. She will be discharged tomorrow. Wonderful. Wow. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Our first success with the human being. To the end of diphtheria. To the end of diphtheria. Mas assim como a tuberculina de Cor, a antitoxina de Beren também encontrou dificuldades. Algumas crianças se recuperaram, mas muitas morreram. Houve amargas recriminações. Na melhor das hipóteses, os resultados foram variáveis. Os testes foram suspensos e ninguém sabia ao certo o que tinha dado errado. Beren, embora não desejasse compartilhar o seu sucesso com ninguém, foi obrigado a pedir ajuda. Já há algum tempo, Erler vinha estudando os problemas da padronização dos soros e foi a ele que Beren pediu auxílio. Simple. You cannot use toxin as a standard because it's unstable. So each batch you prepare must vary in strength. Some is effective, some isn't effective. You know, you understand? That's your problem. Let me show you the toxin I have. Yes. This is it. How old is that? Oh, several weeks. Oh, I can tell you exactly. Never mind. If it was kept that long, it's probably useless. What do you mean? Well, unless you keep toxin in some preservative, it's useless. It's probably decomposed. Now you're just jumping to conclusions. Look how good the results of the Malbit are from the most recent batch of antitoxin that we made with it. Did you use preservative? No, we didn't. But the, the then the Malbit was just lucky. It's probably a mild outbreak. That preparation is useless. Look, there is enough toxin in that flask to supply large-scale manufacture for the next 50 years. Wishful thinking. There's probably not enough there for one horse. Don't be so arrogant, Paul. Look. Look at the result. The death rate is down to 30%. You ask for my advice, I give it. Now, you know as well as I do that the results of the Moabit were more to do with the mildness of the outbreak than the success of your cure. Just look at these figures. I'm not interested in the figures. Now, what is it going to be? Am I going to help you or am I not? Do you have an alternative? Yes, I do. You use the antitoxin as the standard because it's stable. Here, let me show you. Erler não só conseguiu produzir um método preciso para a padronização do soro, mas ao oferecer aos cavalos doses cada vez maiores de toxinas, conseguiu aumentar de forma dramática o nível de antitoxina produzido no próprio sangue dos animais. Durante mais de seis meses, Erler e Beren trabalharam juntos e durante todo esse tempo seus desentendimentos aumentaram. Mas acabaram atingindo o seu objetivo. Um soro de eficácia consistente e capaz de curar. Era o resultado desejado. Mas Erler, um homem que não escondia suas queixas, referiu-se a esta época como a mais infeliz de sua vida. Beren era teimoso, difícil e rancoroso. E estava evidentemente despeitado com seu sucesso. Come. How do you do, sir? Good morning. Want to sit down, cigar? Thank you. Decidiu se autorizar a produção da antitoxina. A autorização foi dada a um laboratório de Frankfurt. Era óbvio que Beren ganharia muito dinheiro em royalties. Mas graças à sua contribuição para o sucesso do tratamento, isso também deveria acontecer a Erler. Foi convocada uma reunião no escritório da companhia para discutir como o dinheiro deveria ser dividido. Ah, oh, Dr. Eddie, come in. Come in. 
An honor to meet you, sir. Oh, thank you. I, I received a telegram. Urgent. It's about the patent, Paul. Well, surely that could have waited. I have some very delicate experimental work to do. Well, you know, you understand. It took me two hours to get here. No, we won't keep you long, sir. Hardly at all if you're interested in what Dr. Baring has to say to you. I was talking to Althoff the other day. Who? Von Gosler's successor, the new Minister of Culture. I told him I thought it was high time you had a research institute of your own. <laughs> well, what did he say? He agreed. After all your work at immunity, he has to. Will it happen? Will it? Will it? A research laboratory of my own with time and money and... When? You would need to forego the royalties from our anti-diphtheria serum. The director of a state institute is not allowed to receive money from commercial interests. Oh. Oh, yes. Well, naturally... Well, perhaps first you should see whether you get given an institute. On the other hand, uh, since your field of research is immunity against disease, you're unlikely to be offered one so long as you're profiting financially from the commercial production of a particular serum. If you do feel inclined to renounce any claim in the company because of this possibility, I have the, the papers ready drawn out for your signature. Yes, can you be sure that you can get me this institute? I have a lot of influence in government circle these days, Paul. All right. Com a parcela de royalties de Erler e com a sua própria parcela de lucros, Beren tornou-se um homem muito rico. Logo receberia o título de barão, com direito ao uso do prefixo von, uma honraria jamais concedida a Kor ou a Erler. Em 1901, Beren conquistava o primeiro prêmio Nobel de Medicina. Quanto a Erler, Beren aparentemente não tinha a influência que afirmava. Durante alguns anos, Erler continuou a trabalhar de graça no pequeno laboratório do Instituto Koch. What is that? Oh, yes, I call that the side chain theory. Allow me to explain it to you. Oh, no, no, not now. I, I beg of you. I, I must get home. My wife expects me. Oh, yes. Um, how is your new tuberculin mark developing? Very well, very well. It's prepared from living virulent strains of human bacilli, dried and ground, and extracted with water to remove all soluble toxins. Good, that sounds promising, very promising. Yes. It may, I think, have a use for diagnostic purposes. As you once said. Did I? Good night. Good night. Oh, I give my regards to Emmy. Emmy and I are parted. You must remember, surely, my present wife's name is Hedvig. Yes, of course, I'm so sorry, Hedvig. Uh, like mine. Yes. Society doesn't altogether approve, I'm afraid. But I made it work abroad. Tropical diseases. Hedvig has the same fondness for travel that I have. Good night. Good night.
Para Cor, o seu trabalho sobre a tuberculina assinalou o fim de sua carreira de grande cientista. A carreira de Erkler, no entanto, estava apenas começando.